be with you this morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Here's what I'd love to do for us. I'd love to pray for us, and then we'll jump into the text. Let's pray. Sovereign Father, we thank you and praise you for how good and gracious you are to us all the time. Uh, Lord, we just, I just, we do praise you for the weather, Lord, and uh, being in this particular region uh, to witness um, your beauty and creation every day, uh, just a gift, Lord. Um, we often think, if this is your footstool, how much more beautiful your face. Uh, please come and join us today as we open up your word. Uh, speak to me, speak through me. Come guide us as you so see fit. And Lord, um, as the passage says, please open up our eyes that we might see you for who you are. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if you've been with us at Summit for the past six months, you'll recall we've been in the Gospel of John. And this week I'm super excited because we're in John chapter 10, the discourse on the Good Shepherd. Now, uh, most of us are familiar with this passage. I love this uh, story about the Good Shepherd. As you guys know, I'm from the city, so I've had to learn a lot about uh, shepherding and farming and ranching out here in the county. And I actually have something to run by you that I heard a pastor say about this passage. I thought it was interesting. He said this, if a horse goes wild, if it runs away, it becomes a wild stallion. If a goat goes feral, goes wild, runs off, it becomes a wild goat. But if a sheep runs off, a sheep becomes a dead sheep. Is this consistent with your observations in the county? Did I pass the Wallowa County you know, farming test there? When I heard it, I said, that sounds legit. I'll run it by people who actually know sheep and all this kind of stuff. But it, it seemed to make sense for me. One of the things we see in Scripture throughout the totality of Scripture is that Scripture says that all of us are sheep. And therefore, all of us need shepherds. Even if, uh, and all of us, sorry, not need shepherds. All of us, uh, we're sheep and we have shepherds, whether that's ourselves, whether that's the Lord, or whether that's something else. Today, what Jesus does is he informs us of the best shepherd, of the good shepherd. The question John wants us to be wrestling with is, it's not whether or not we have a shepherd. We are sheep. We have a shepherd. The question is, who is your shepherd and what is the character of your shepherd? Fortunately, today's text informs us. But before we jump into this discourse on the good shepherd, I've got to share with you something my senior pastor used to say all the time, and he was right about it. He said, a text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. And I never understood what that meant until recently. He said, a text without a context is a pretext for a proof text. And what that means is, unless, if you just take a verse of scripture and you take it out of its context, you can prove what you want to prove with it, but you might not be able to prove what scripture wants you to prove with it. So as we jump into the discourse on the Good Shepherd, we are going to make sure we take a look at it in its context so that we understand what John and Jesus want us to understand, not just what Dave wants to teach on today. Does that make sense? Not just fun shepherding -ness, if that makes sense. In order for us to understand the discourse on the Good Shepherd, we've got to take a look at three things. We've got to take a look at the context of the passage. We've got to take a look at the content of the passage. And we've got to take a look at the contrast in the passage. And only after going through those three things will we understand what Jesus means when he says, I am the Good Shepherd. Does that make sense? All right. So if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in John 10. Before I read the text... I want to draw your attention to this. Most of us are familiar that when the New Testament letters were written, they were not written with chapters and verses. Those came about 1,300 years. 13 to 1,500 years later is when we added in chapter and verse. The reason that's important is sometimes when I'm reading my Bible, I'll be like, cool, I just got through chapter 9. Now the next day I'll start chapter 10 and I think, oh, we're in a brand new season. We're in a brand new sermon. We're in a brand new episode. This just starts, you know, a, a new thing. But it's important to understand that whenever we're reading a text that the people who ascribed chapter and verses to the text did not necessarily organize the text the way that the text is organized. They just... They didn't slap numbers on it, but they kind of did. Does that make sense? So as we jump into today's chapter, chapter 10, it's important to note that the red letters do not start at verse 1, but they actually started previously in verse 9. The Good Shepherd Discourse is actually an answer to a question that's been posed by the Pharisees. What was that question? It's what we looked at last week, which is when the Pharisees asked the question, so are we also blind? That's where our text actually starts today. We're taking a look at chapter 10, but it kind of begins at the end of 9. If you got your Bibles, we're going to start in 940 in order to understand 
what Jesus means when he says, I am the good shepherd. Verse 40 says this of chapter 9. Some of the Pharisees near Jesus heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. Chapter 10, verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. In order for us to understand the discourse on the Good Shepherd, which is about to follow in a couple of verses, first we have to take a look at the context in which the answer is given. The Pharisees asked the question, are we also blind? And last week we answered that Jesus said, his response to that was, yes, boys, you are blind, you are ignorant. And you'd like to think that it's a testament to your innocence, but it's actually a testament to your arrogance. You are blind not because you cannot see, but because you refuse to listen. That's how we ended chapter 9. But then we jump straight into chapter 10 where Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, if a thief enters in, not by the gatekeeper, you know, that man is a thief and a robber, right? This is a continuing. This is very typical of Jesus to respond to somebody's question first with a principle and then to give them a picture that unpacks the principle he just gave them. That's what we just read right there. Now, our question is, what does that picture paint? What is in that parable of sorts? Well, he talks about a gatekeeper, a thief, a shepherd, and sheep, right? I'm not from Wallowa County. You guys know this, all right? I stick out like a sore thumb in certain circles, you know, because I don't know what I'm talking about or what I'm doing in life. But when I look at this passage, one of the most helpful ways for me to understand it is I grew up in the city and not around sheep pens or sheep or anything like that. I grew up around, when I think of this passage, I think of parking garages, okay? Like a city... Kind of, and they're kind of similar, okay? In a sheep pen back then, you had a gatekeeper, one who would allow the sheep in and the shepherds in and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, in, in a parking garage, a couple weeks ago, Jen and I went to Portland, and we parked our car for a couple days, and then we had to take out a small loan to be able to pay for it as we got our car back out. But, uh, but there was the, the little gatekeeper, right? The guy in the security booth takes your ticket, takes your money, all that kind of stuff. There's a gatekeeper, right? And in parking garages, there are owners of vehicles, right? And then there are vehicles, there are cars themselves. This is how I help understand this passage. The uh, gatekeepers are the same, uh, shepherds and owners, and then there's cars and sheep, right? And in the parking garage, you have three things that have legitimate access. A gatekeeper, owners to the vehicles, and you have the cars themselves. They all belong. What Jesus is saying to the Pharisees in this text is, he says, you're not the gatekeeper, you're not an owner of a vehicle, and you refuse to be a car or you refuse to be a sheep, and yet you claim that you are in the parking garage. But if you're not a gatekeeper, you're not an owner, and you're not a car, what are you doing here? You are trespassing. You must be in the parking garage, in the sheep pen with illegitimate access, with ill intentions, either towards the sheep, the cars, or the owners and the shepherds. Does this make sense? Jesus is unpacking what he just said. What he's saying to the, to the Pharisees is this. He's saying, you guys are asking if you're blind. You are blind because you say you see. You insist that you are in the parking garage, that you are in the pen, and yet you are not submitting to the shepherd. So you're not a sheep, you're not the gatekeeper, you're not the shepherd. So what are you doing in the pen? You must be here for with ill intentions, and you must be here illegally, and you must be dealt with. You are trespassing and you are guilty. Does this make sense? If it doesn't... Um, if it doesn't make sense to you yet, that's totally fine because, curiously enough, it actually didn't make sense to the Pharisees. We take a look in verse 6. What does it say? It says, this figure of speech Jesus used with the Pharisees, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Can I pause here for just a minute and draw your attention to the nature of blindness and how scary it is in Scripture? We have seen in previous passages that these guys are blind to the light, they are blind to the truth. 
They are blind to their trespass. They are blind to their guilt. And now we see in this text, they are blind to the explanation of all those things. Do you see how blinding blindness is in scripture? This is a scary, scary reality. The last thing you want to be in scripture is you don't want to be blind and you don't want to have a hardened heart, which are sometimes used interchangeably. Because when you're blind in scripture, you're blind even toward your blindness. You're not even aware of it. These guys cannot even be explained their situation and understand it. They need a further unpacking. And you know what is so cool in this passage? Jesus gives it to them. These guys are over here plotting his death, trying to destroy his flock. And they say, we don't understand the critique that you're giving us. We don't understand the sentence that you've delivered our way. And he says, okay, well, then let's back it up. Let me explain it to you again. They are blind, and he is patient, and that is a good thing for me and for you. So Jesus, after they don't understand this, what does he do? In verse 7, he explained it to him again. Dial into this part right here. So it says in verse 7, So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. Okay. Now, when I first read that, I was confused. And indeed, you might have some confusion as well. Because once again, I'm like, ah, ah, Jesus, you are mixing your metaphors. When I did this back in high school, I got points off. And here you're doing it all over the place. Because in this text, Jesus, you're saying that you're the shepherd. Okay, I got you. And now you're saying that you're the door. Wait a minute. Are you the shepherd or are you the door? And in the previous passage, you actually said that there is a gatekeeper or a doorkeeper. doorkeeper. So Jesus... Who are you? What's going on in this text? Why are you mixing your metaphors? You're you're confusing us. This is why it is helpful for me to understand the sheep pen in terms of parking garages. Does it make sense? Okay. I'm going to show you two sentences, and I want you for a moment. Does the question make sense? seems as though Jesus is mixing his metaphors. What the heck is going on in this passage? That's basically what I'm going to answer right now. This is why parking garages are so helpful for me. I'm going to give you two sentences. I want you just to have, like... Think about, be aware of what comes to your mind as I show you these sentences. The first one is this. Andrew, the Viking, is in the parking garage. Now, the Viking has nothing to do with anything. It's just I like picking on Andrew because he looks like a Viking, and he likes to drive cars, and I pictured him in the parking garage. Now, I've thoroughly confused you. I'll draw your attention back to the sentence. It's this. Andrew is in the parking garage. Okay, did you get a mental image? Okay. Now, I want you to imagine I did not just show you that sentence, and just randomly I told you, you know, we were hanging out the other day. I was like, oh, did you know? Second sentence is Andrew is parking in the garage. Now, those are two different sentences that have two completely different meanings, even though they contain the exact same words, we just changed the order a little bit. In the first sentence, in my mind, what comes to mind is I picture Andrew the Viking and his giant Toyota Tundra in a parking garage in Portland with hundreds of cars around him, right? But in the second sentence, if you were just to tell me that, oh, Andrew's parking in the garage, I would not picture a public parking garage. I would picture a home garage, right? Andrew's backing in his giant Toyota Tundra into his personal private garage. In the first sentence, we have a public garage in mind, lots of cars. In the second one, we have a private garage, maybe one or two cars. If it's a Tundra, you're only going to fit the Tundra in the garage. You guys track it with me? There's a difference. In your mind, because you know English and because you know um, the cultural nuances of parking garages, you recognize that those are two different things, even though someone who did not know English or did not know our culture would not be able to recognize the perceivable difference between the two of these. You guys tracking with me? The reason I tell you that is because we are reading a text that is 2,000 years removed from us. We don't understand the language, and we oftentimes don't understand the culture. And yet, the original audience to this text would have just recognized that Jesus just made a shift from a public sheep parking garage to a private sheep parking garage in this text. It's imperceptible to us, but to them, they would have picked up right on it. Does this make sense? Because in this text we just read, what he is saying is... Um, basically he's alluding to this. Back in the day, 
these guys went into a major town with their sheep. They would drop their sheep off at a public parking garage. There'd be a gatekeeper. And inside this massively sized pen, there would be tons of sheep, not, not all owned by one shepherd, by multiple shepherds. They'd drop them off. Perhaps they were bringing them into town to sell them off, to trade, uh, perhaps to get them sheared. He would drop them off. And this is why in the first passage, it talks about the shepherd coming and saying, okay, guys, I'm done. Now dasher and dancer and prawner and prancer, right? He would call all his sheep and they would run to him and he would leave with them. They'd pass through the gate. Does this make sense? In the second text, he's not talking about a really big public parking garage. He's talking about a private one that would be at the shepherd's home. It is a different pin. Jesus just made a shift that they would have understood that it takes us time to parcel out. But now that we're aware of it, the text makes more sense. Because in a private pen, it would have been only this shepherd's sheep there. It would have been a smaller uh, pen made out of stone. And what was likely going to happen is that there was a cleft in the rock that was considered the gate. And there was not a door there for the way that the shepherd managed sheep coming in and out is he himself would literally lay in the cleft of the rock to act as both the shepherd and the door. These guys would have picked up on it intuitively. They would have known what he's talking about. Does this make sense? At the private pen, it was a smaller arena, if you will. The sheep would come in and out. Instead of having a wood door or a little gate that goes up and down like this, the shepherd himself, when the sheep were in the pen, would lie in the, cr in the cleft of the rock. And so literally acting as the door. If something wanted to get legitimately into the pen or legitimately out of the pen, they would have to do so over and by the shepherd's body. Does that make sense? This is why in this portion of the text, Jesus can say, I am both the door and the shepherd, and no Pharisees raising their hands saying, well, wait, which one are you? They understood he was both at the same time. In the first text, it's a public parking garage. In the second text, it is a private parking garage. But the point of both of the garages is the same. Jesus is saying, if you find yourself in the pen, if you claim to be in the pen, and yet you are not the shepherd, you are not the gatekeeper, and you refuse to be a sheep. You are there illegally. You have trespassed, and you're there with ill motives. You want to harm the sheep and steal from the shepherd, and I, the good shepherd, am going to deal with you. Does this make sense? This is what Jesus is communicating to the shepherds. Because you claim to see, you are claiming to be in the pen. But because you refuse to submit to the shepherd, you are here as a trespasser, as a thief, as a robber. You're here to steal kill and destroy. And I'm the shepherd. I'm going to stop you at the door. I'm now confronting you. Does this make sense? That's what Jesus is getting at. Now, having taken a look at the context of the passage and the content in the passage, we are now set up to see the contrast of the different characters in the passage. Does this make sense? Because now Jesus is going to go on and unpack what he was talking about by addressing the three characters in the story. How are you guys doing? Are you all doing okay? That was a ton of information. You guys tracking with me? You sheep pens, parking garages, somebody is thoroughly confused. Where do we park our sheep? That's what someone's asking right now. But hopefully you're tracking with me thus far. What Jesus has basically said to the Pharisees is, yes, indeed, you are blind because you claim to be here legitimately, but you refuse to acknowledge, you, you don't have the right credentials because you refuse to acknowledge me as the authority, as the shepherd. You won't submit to me, and therefore you're here with the wrong motives. Make sense? You guys tracking me? Now he sets us up to contrast the three elements of the story that we've been looking at. He wants to draw our attention to the thieves. He wants to draw our attention to the shepherd. He wants to draw our attention to the sheep. How can we find out about that? Well, let's continue to read what he says. Verse 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they, the sheep, may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and carries, cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep, and I have other sheep that are not of this fold, I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. 
For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This charge or command I have received from my Father. And he ends there for now. In this last passage, having established this whole metaphor of sheep and thieves and, and, and pins and stuff like that, Jesus now says, now I want to inform you of the character of the three parties we've been talking about. First, let's talk about the thieves. What he says, he gives it one sentence. He says, the thieves came to steal, kill, and destroy. Synonyms for these words are, the thieves come to rob, to murder, and to annihilate. They come to take things away from people. They come to take life from people. They come to take everyone, everything from people. And indeed, that's what you guys are. You have come to steal, kill, and destroy. And actually, you know what's so crazy? That's what we've seen in the text thus far when it comes to the Pharisees. Do you guys remember a long time ago, one of the first things Jesus does in his public ministry after he changes the water to wine? What does he do? He goes to the temple. And he clears it out. And what does he say? He says, do not make my father's house a house of trade. You Pharisees, you religious leaders, you are robbing my people. You are stealing from them and you are stealing from God. The Pharisees have been stealing all throughout their tenure, if you will. But also we saw in a couple chapters ago, these guys like to murder. What do they do with the woman caught in adultery? They don't give her uh, proper justice, as we saw, nor do they give her good counseling. What do they do? Effectively, in the story, what we see is they're basically dragging her out by her hair, casting her before Jesus, and saying, all right, at the end of the day, we're either going to kill her or trap you. This is what we're all about. They steal, they kill. Uh, another episode in, 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 in John, we're going to see after Lazarus comes back to life, do you remember what the Pharisees try and do with him? They try and kill him. It's, the irony is ter- tremendous. It's amazing. What do they do with Jesus at the end of the story? They kill him. These guys are all about stealing. They're all about killing. They're all about destroying. Picture the story that we just saw a minute ago. Here's this blind beggar who's been blind from birth. And he's been begging his entire life. And somehow, by the sheer grace of God, he gets his sight back and he comes to the Pharisees and what they're supposed to do is they're supposed to rejoice with him. They're supposed to affirm him. They're supposed to welcome him into the community. And what do they do? They put him on trial and they sell, They say, tell us again and again and again how you gained your sight because we don't care about your sight. We care about trapping Jesus. The only time we pointed this out last week, the only time in the story, the healing of the blind man where someone says, wow, this is amazing. It's not when they look at the blind man and say, wow, this is amazing, you've got your sight. It's the blind man saying to the Pharisees, this is amazing that you guys aren't rejoicing with me right now. And what do they do? They kick him out of the temple. The little that this guy ever had, which was he could still go to the temple to worship God, to still be in fellowship with other people, what do they do? They steal it from him. The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And indeed, that's what the Pharisees have been doing this entire time. That's what we know about the thieves. Make sense? Did you guys finish high school? You don't have to answer that. But I don't know about you. In high school and college, and Duff, you may have done this to your poor students, but uh, we were oftentimes given essays. And it was something to the effect of compare and contrast the Germans with the Russians, right, in World War II. And so what would you do? You'd compare it. Now, in those cases, it's really easy to identify what they're different on, right? So like I would start out my essay by saying, well, the Germans were Germans and the Russians were from Russia, right? And they spoke German, like, you know, oh, it was bad stuff. But I noticed I would always get extra points if I not only could articulate how they were different, but if I could also articulate how they were similar. And in this story, one thing I want to draw your attention to is thieves, wolves, and shepherds all have one thing in common. What is it? They are all very, very interested in the sheep, but with different reasons why. A wolf likes sheep a lot. A thief likes sheep a lot. A shepherd likes sheep a lot, but they all like them for different reasons. The wolf and the thief want a sheep in order that they might take life from it. The shepherd loves the sheep in order that he might give life to it. Does this make sense? Why do I draw your attention to this? Because oftentimes we... We go with the suitor who seems most interested in us. 
But one thing scripture wants to warn us of is you do not gauge your involvement with something based on how interested it is in you. You base it on its integrity. You don't base it on its charisma. You base it on its character. Do not be surprised when the enemy comes to you, lavishing gifts on you in order that he might woo you over. The best thieves and the best murderers never tell you they are thieves or murderers. They try and win you over, and then they destroy you. Just to be mindful, thieves and wolves are very interested in the sheep. Uh, the question is why. Take time to observe the fruit before you give it yourself over to them. That's anecdotal aside. Nothing to do with, well, it kind of has something to do with what we're talking about. But first thing we see, thieves came to steal, rob, and destroy. Second character in the text is the good shepherd. The thieves come in order that they might take life. The shepherd comes in order that he might give life. This is amazing to me in the text. Jesus says, I not only came to give life, I came to give life and give it abundantly. He's saying, those guys want to take your life. I want to give you life, and I want to pour it out on your head. That's what I came to offer. Uh, Jesus even contrasts himself with the wolves and thieves. He literally says, they came to take your life. I'm not here to take your life. In fact, at the end of the day, you're going to find that I'm going to give my life for you. They take your life. A decent shepherd will protect your life, but no, I'm going to offer my life up. Even these guys, in the hearing of these words, they knew that David was one of the best shepherds of all time. And they knew that David would go and, uh, you know, uh, fight off bears, lions and tigers and bears. Oh my, right? He would fight them off. But David always did so at the risk of his life. And David, if he knew at the end of the day it would cost him his life, would not offer himself up. Jesus says, no, I know what this is going to cost me. This is going to cost me my my life and I gladly lay it down for my sheep. This indeed is a good shepherd. He knows what's happening. He knows even as he talks with the shepherd. In the next passage, we're going to see literally there's a point where everyone gathers around him. We're supposed to see the wolves and thieves just pressing in around him saying, we want the sheep. And he's saying, over my dead body. This is the kind of shepherd that he is. He is one who offers himself up on our behalf. They take life. He gives his life in order that we might, as sheep, be well protected. That is amazing to me. But perhaps um, the most amazing part to me in this text is it talks about the character of the good shepherd is this. It says, um, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay my, da- my life down for the sheep. Can I tell you what's so amazing about that? Do you realize the connection he just made? He said, I know my own and my own know me just as I am known by my father and my father knows me. Jesus says this, the bond that I have between me and my sheep is equivalent to the bond that I have between me and my father. That gives me so much comfort at the end of the day because I, you know, I mean, we're all wayward sheep and we run off and every time we do, he says, I'm coming for you. And in, in the same way, I will never separate myself from my father. I will never lose this bond. So I will never lose that, the bond that I have with you. It is as strong here as it is here. I am as connected to my father as I am connected with you. Gosh, can I just tell you that gives me so much comfort at the end of the day. Because it does add great cost to himself. He is saying, Dave, there's nothing you can do to separate yourself from me. If you're my sheep, you're my sheep, and I'm coming for you. And indeed, is that not what we saw in the previous text? What happens to the blind man? He loses everything. The Pharisees cast him out of the temple, we've talked, or out of the synagogue. We've talked about what that means, and what that means for him is that was social, economic, religious suicide. He was a social leper now, and no one wanted anything to do with him. And yet, who comes to search him out? It is Jesus saying, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? It is he who is speaking to you, and your eyes have seen him. He falls on his face and says, Lord, I believe, and he worships him. The bond that Jesus has with us is the same strength that he has with his father. Are you kidding me? You know that bond will never break, and what he's telling you is you now know that this bond will never break either. If you're my sheep, I've got you. I'm your good shepherd. I lay down my life for you. Uh... No doubt in the minds of the disciples right now, perhaps in the blind man, maybe even in the Pharisees, what text was coming to mind? It was uh, 
Well, I, I got to tell you, this, the, uh, the text means a lot to me because it was the first message I ever preached here in Willowa County. And I thought, I didn't know. It was my candidating sermon, Psalm 23. And when we came here, I didn't know if we'd get the job. But I said, God, I'm just so grateful that I get to share Psalm 23 with people. And Psalm 23, ever since then, has been, been so special in the heart because it represents all that the Lord's done in my life. And what does it say? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me on paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And as I sit at a table in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. You prepare a table before me. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is what this text is talking about. I am the good shepherd. Jesus in this text is saying, I am Yahweh. I am the Lord, and in me you lack nothing. Let me be your shepherd. Watch me not take life for you, from you. Watch me give it to you at great cost to my own, and I will bind myself to you that no matter how many wolves, how many thieves come over this wall, I will fight them off at great cost to myself. You just be a sheep. You just lie down in the green pastures. You just sit beside the still waters. You just trust me when we're going to the valley. I will prepare a table before you. I will pour out oil upon your head. Your cup will overflow. And as you follow me, goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. That's the kind of shepherd I am. That's what he's talking about in this text. This is the good shepherd. Oh, I just look at that and say, why would I not want to follow him? Why would I not want to have him lead me? Yes, sir, whatever you ask. I will trust you in the dark in order that I might later see you in the light. Lead me, good shepherd. Lead me. I encourage you this morning to do just that. Let him lead you. Three characters in this text. Thieves who come to steal, rob, and destroy. Uh, sorry, steal, kill, and destroy. Good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. And there's one other character in this story. And what is it? Or one other, yeah, character. It is the sheep themselves. And I just love this in the text because there's so little talked about of the sheep in this text. You want to know the only thing we know about sheep and their character in the story? It's this. The sheep know my voice and they listen to me. If you want to know this morning whether or not you are his sheep or whether uh, we're all in the pen, is what this story is telling us. We're, the, we're either there as thieves and robbers or we're there as sheep. If you want to know, is he my shepherd or is he my shepherd who is protecting me or is he the shepherd who's fighting against me? The answer is, are you listening to his voice? Are you following him? When he speaks, do you say, yes, sir, please lead me? Whatever you say, it doesn't make sense to me. That's the mark of a sheep in this passage. That's the mark of a sheep in every passage we've been looking at for the past few months. It is, do you listen to the shepherd? How do I know we're on the right trail? Because take a look at how the passage ends. We'll close out the context on this particular subset of the text. Verse 19, <clears throat> there was again a division among the Jews because of his words. Many of them said, he has a demon and is insane. Why listen to him? And others said, These are not the words of one who is oppressed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of a man born blind? What are they saying? There's one group who listens to him and the other one who doesn't. John's question to you this morning is, which group are you in? Are you in the group that listens to the shepherd and abides by his instruction and therefore is protected by him? Or are you in the group that the shepherd actively actually fights against to protect his sheep. I don't know about you, just a simple testament of um, my life and experiences would be if you don't know the shepherd, my God, I, I encourage you, beg him that you might hear his voice, that he might open up your eyes, that you might see him for who he is, because he is a good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep in order that they might have green pastures still waters in order that they might sit at the table with their cups overflowing with goodness and mercy following all the days of their life. My encouragement to you this morning is to hear the shepherd means you're a sheep and he is a good shepherd indeed. I'm going to pray for us. The band's going to come on up and uh, we're just going to spend, spend time
singing praises back to the shepherd, thinking about him. Sovereign Father, we thank you and praise you for how good and gracious you are to us all the time. Lord, I pray for myself in the aspects and areas of my life where I am blind to your truth, where I am calloused to your prodding. Oh God, I just ask that you do whatever it takes to supersede that. For my brothers and sisters in here who can echo that prayer, Lord, I just I pleaded on their behalf too, Lord, that you do whatever it takes to open up our eyes to see you for who you are. That you do whatever it takes to uh, break any hardness of heart that we might have in order that we might have you as our shepherd, Lord. In order that we might see you for who you are. In order that we might be in the pen under your protection as opposed to being in the pen and under your watchful, careful, calculated, and just eye. We love you. Please guide us as you so see fit, Lord, and speak so loud that we cannot help but hear and listen to who you are and what you've done on our behalf. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.